All right, let's start the class. I'm going to put this, mm, maybe I should just minimize it. Minimize it and then, there's my big screen here. Okay, all right, so today we're going to talk about ionizing, interaction of ionizing radiation with matter. And uh, this is covered in Khan chapter 5, up to and includes 5.10, 5 so it includes 5.10 and not the rest of it. There's only a, a, couple, of a couple of sections after that. Uh, and then Pogorshak 1 and 2, uh, these are, one of them is the review class and the other one is the, um, the actual textbook, textbook, and those are covered in chapter 1 and 5. And Johns and Cunningham chapters 5 and 6. Have you folks got Johns and Cunningham yet? Not yet. You did? Okay. All right. Get, get that book as soon as you can because I, uh, I refer it quite a bit. Refer to it quite a bit. Okay, so first the units. Let's discuss some units, and I have talked about these units before in the past. Let's just review them. Uh, Runken is a unit of exposure. So when people say exposure, the units of exposure is Runken. Sometimes people get confused between, between dose and exposure, but as physicists, whenever we use the term exposure, we talk about Runkens, and we talk about um, uh, the definition of a Runken is right here, 2.58 times 10 to the minus 4. You should memorize that number, it's important. You're gonna use it in conversions a lot. 2.58 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram of air. Okay, so one Runken is the amount of exposure that releases this much charge in one kilogram of air. That's a lot of air. Think about how much air a kilogram, I mean it's rooms and rooms of air, right? Okay, so that's how much charge uh, one Runken will release in, uh, in a kilogram of air. Okay, next unit is, and, and Runken is also, it's a unit that's called a quantity, whereas dose is more about quality because it has to do with energy. Okay, so there's, there's no energy here. It's just numbers, numbers of ions that get created. All right, so moving to dose, the gray. The gray is a unit of, of absorbed dose, and uh, one gray is equal to one joule per kilogram of material. All right, so now we're no longer talking about coulombs per kilogram. Now we're talking about joules per kilogram, units of energy. So how much energy is being imparted to the material, tissue, material, whatever that is, okay, per kilo, one joule per kilogram. The old unit was rads, and that's what a lot of most people today still talk about in the in the public. People talk about rads, and uh, and that that the conversion between rads and gray is very simple. One hundred rads is one gray. Okay. Now, conveniently, one hundred one rad is one centigrade. All right. So we use centigrade in the clinic quite often because it's a convenient term. We often treat our patients with the same dose, 180 centigrade per day. So it's a convenient term, and we don't have to use decimals. But Europe, my feeling is that Europe tends to use gray more than centigrade. So a lot of their, a lot of their doses are uh, 1.8, or um, so there's decimals in there. So we, we avoid decimals by using centigrade, okay? So that's gray, all right? Then moving, moving on to Siebert, and again, gray, remember gray is units of absorbed dose. Moving on to sievert, the sievert is a unit of dose equivalent. And the, uh, the unit is described by the letter H. And dose is usually, by the way, dose is usually described by the letter D, okay, capital D. So sievert is described by the letter H, capital H, and this is covered in Kahn page 354. So this, we jump a little bit here, page 354, because Kahn has a section on radiation protection, and that's where they cover the Siebert. But just since we're talking about units, I wanted to throw the Siebert in here. Now, Siebert is equal to, so H is equal to dose times the Q, which is a requ uh, radiation quantity, quantity sorry, radiation type factor. Um, now, and we already talked about that before. Uh, the old unit, the old unit, let's see if I can, Okay, so the old unit was REM, and you've probably heard of REM also, and the conversion between the old unit and the new unit is again 100 times. So 100 times the unit, new unit, uh, sorry, 100 times the old unit is equal to the new unit of sieverts. One REM is one centisievert, the little c is centisievert, okay. So, um, and the reason we want this quality factor is because it gives more weight to heavier particles, uh, because ultimately, we want to know what radiation damage this does to, to humans and to, to biological tissue. So by assigning a, a quality factor to this, um, by assigning the quality factor, we can, we can um, kind of get a, get a better idea of how much biological damage 
this radiation type is, is doing. For example, one dose of one, sorry, one, dose, one centigrade of protons does different biological damage than one centigrade of neutrons. But one sievert of neutrons has the same biological effect as one sievert of photons, okay, biologically. Uh, of course, then there's also different tissue types too. So then, so then this Q factor, we're going to talk, we're going to look at the Q factor on the next screen. But the next, the next one you know, we want to talk about is the effective dose equivalent, HE. And H sub E, E stands for effective, and H again is, um, is the dose equivalent, is, and this is in quotes here because this comes from, this quote probably comes from Kahn, the sum of the weighted dose equivalents for irradiated tissues or organs. And it includes genetic risk. Okay, so now we have dose, then we have, we started with dose, then we, then we went to sieverts for dose equivalent. Now we want to know, now we know that different types of radiation have different biological uh, effects. Now we want to see how we know that different organs have different sensitivities, okay? especially in terms of genetics. I mean, if you irradiate somebody's finger and then you irradiate somebody's gonads, it's going to have a very different a genetic effect. Because if you irradiate somebody's gonads, their kids are going to possibly, depending on how much dose, possibly be born with genetic side effects. Okay? So we want some, some way of weighting that uh, in terms of long-term uh, long damage. All right, so here's some Q, value, Q values. So the Q values, backing up one slide, Q values come from this Q right here. So the Q values for photons uh, of all energies, Q is equal to one. For electrons and muons of all energies, Q is equal to one. Okay. So, which means that dose and dose equivalent are the same for these two. All right, and then neutrons. So neutrons get a little complicated. Neutrons of energy less than 10 keV the Q value is 5. 10 kV to 100 kV, Q value is 10. So you can see the Q value is rising as the energy rises. 100 to 2 MeV, Q value is 20. So these folks right here do the most biological damage. Then it drops again. Then we're dropping down to 10. Whoops. So, so now between 2 and 20, we drop down to 10. Uh, and then uh, and then uh, neutrons greater than 20, the Q value drops to 5. Okay, but the Q value never drops below 5 for neutrons, all right? So just think neutrons are always going to be more biologically effective, more than uh, electrons and photons, okay? And in some cases, extremely more biological uh, effective, looking at this 20 right here, between 100 and 2 MeV, <coughs> okay? Now, what about, did you have a question? No. Oh, I heard you, I thought I heard you. Uh, protons of energy greater than 2 MeV have a Q value of 5. Alpha particles and other atomic nuclei, and protons tend to have energy way above 2 MeV. I mean, the proton facility, the protons that are coming out of there, I believe are around 130 MeV. So they're, the Q value is uh, 5 for protons. Alpha particles and other atomic nuclei, so big nuclei have a big Q value because they're just so <coughs> massive and they interact, uh, they interact and they cause all kinds of damage because they're so big. All right, and then um, going back one slide, the, the W values here, this equation, so this is the dose, the effective dose equivalent um, is equal to the, the dose equivalent times the weighting factor. Now the weighting factors are here. So W sub T are the weighting factors. So gonads have probably the biggest weighting factor because that affects the genetics of the, of the, uh, of the person and possibly uh, could be translated to genetic side effects for the, for the kids. And maybe even more than one generation. It can go like five generations down. Uh, breast 0.5 because uh, breast is sensitive for uh, for induction of breast cancer. Uh, bone marrow, colon, lung, stomach 0.12. Um, so st uh, colon and stomach are sensitive. They're just very sensitive organs because the cells, the epithelial cells that line the walls, multiply very quickly. So if they get irradiated, the the likelihood of having side effects because they multiply very quickly the likelihood of uh, experiencing side effects is higher than cells that multiply slowly. And the reason for that is because there's, there's one part in the cell cycle, and you'll learn all this in detail in radiation biology, the one part, there's one part in the cell cycle that it's very sensitive. So if they multiply very quickly, the chances of being in that, in that part of the cell cycle is higher than if they multiply slowly. So that's, that's why those two are sensitive. And, um, 
Okay, so bladder, brain, uh, all those other organs, 0 0.03, and then bone, bone surface, 0 0.03. If you add all these up, they add up to one. Okay. All right, more units. Fluence. Uh, fluence is the number of photons per centimeter square. And there's a, there's a diagram here. Just picture, picture a source, and the source is emitting radiation isotropically, which means uh, all around in, in all directions, in three dimensions. And so when we look at fluence, we look at the number of photons per centimeter square that traverse a part of a sphere, like a small section of a sphere. Okay? This is, you, you guys know calculus, so in calculus DNDA, this means a small number of, of photons divided by a very small area. Okay? And that area is, that area is an area on a, on a part of a sphere, okay, a little section of a sphere. So it's it's quanti so fluence is quantity and it's designated by this letter. Sorry about that. It's designated by the letter um, phi, Greek letter capital capital phi. I lose my pen sometimes. Capital phi. Okay. It's a measure of quantity, how many per area. All right. And then there's flux density is the next one, and that's lowercase phi, and that's fluence rate. That's just fluence divided by time. Okay. How many photons per centimeter squared per Second, so it's how fast that radiation is going through. So if you, so if I increase my dose rep, my rep rate on my linear accelerator from 100 to 400, that's going to increase the fluence rate, right? Okay, so that's going to increase rate because I'm increasing the number of photons per second. Okay, then the next one's energy fluence. Energy fluence, um, but it's designated by the Greek letter psi, capital psi is the energy. Now we're moving from quantity to energy. So it's the energy per centimeter square. How much energy is being imparted in a tissue or material uh, per centimeter square? Okay, so this is a measure of beam quality. And energy flux density, these, these terms are getting pretty complicated, is the energy fluence rate. So energy per area divided by time. Right, so basically you just have to memorize these and kind of get a feeling when you're reading in the books, kind of get a feeling of, of what that means. Okay, because those terms do come up. Um, all right, next. All right. A little animation there. How do I know? How do I know if this is still recording? It's, it's minimized. It probably it's probably okay. Uh, so now, so those I want to just discuss those terms because those are important for you to know. The next part, the next um, section here, is going to be interact how radiation interacts with matter. And uh, so we're going to start with the charged particle comes, comes within a distance b. This little b you'll see in a lot of books, and it's also known as the impact parameter. That's another term for b. So a charged particle comes within a distance b of the nucleus of an atom with a radius a. Okay, so that's just the radius of the atom is a, and b is the distance from the center of, from the nucleus to, um, to its trajectory, to its path, the closest path. And then, so let's define some terms. Ionization is removal, removal of an orbital electron leaving the atom with a charge. Okay, so this, this comes in, and if it knocks out one of the electrons, then the atom becomes ionized. Okay, we know that. And now the atom now has a charge. Then excitation, uh, this, this object, or this particle, charged particle, doesn't have enough energy or is too far away from the, from the atom to ionize it, but it excites it. And it excites it, how does it excite it? It can raise, it can raise the, um, the energy level by having the electron go from one subshell to another subshell. Okay? Jump from one subshell to another subshell. It can't go from the K to the L, because that would be like ionizing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the, the small jumps be the, between the subshell, like the L, L1 to L3 jumps. Okay? So once it jumps to another subshell, then it, it becomes ionized. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> it becomes excited. Okay, so that's so atom rises to another energy state. So those are two possibilities that can happen. And the charged particles we're talking about, protons, electrons, alpha particles, those are all charged. They're called directly ionizing radiation. They deposit energy in the medium through Coulombic interactions with orbital electrons. So directly ionizing means that they're they are solely responsible for ionizing the atom. There's also indirectly ionizing radiation. That's when a particle Creates another, creates another um, very reactive substance, and you'll learn this in radiation biology too in more detail. And that reactive substance 
then it goes on to ionize it. So one example is um is an o like an OH OH negative. Okay, so that's um uh, this is um an OH negative. It's, it's um I forgot the term. I think it's called a hydroxyl. But anyway, this is a highly reactive particle that gets created from radiation, and this particle goes on to ionize other other um, molecules in the tissue. So directly ionizing means that this particle is going to ionize the material. Indirectly it means that it's going to create a, uh, a reactive substance first, and then that substance is going to ionize. You're going to learn this in a lot more detail in radiation biology. Okay, so next slide. Electrons interacting in material. Soft collisions. Uh, some more some more definitions. So a soft collision is a collision that the particle comes in in the vicinity of this of this atom, but it's pretty far from it. It's okay, it doesn't come too close. So the impact parameter is a lot larger than the radius. And what happens? So only a small amount of energy is transferred to the orbital electrons because it's so far, right? So the incidence Coulomb field, atoms have a Coulombic field, particles have a Coulombic field. Those two fields don't interact very, very strongly. So the incidence Coulomb field affects the atom as a whole, distorting it or exciting it. Okay, so most common type of interaction, this is actually the most common. You know, we're all, we, we think that we're solid, right? But we're, we're solid just because we have this um, electrostatic force that when we put two things together, it can't, you can't put your hands through it because you have, you have the weak force, the electrostatic force keeping you from doing that. But really, we're all empty space. I mean, the nucleus is, the nucleus has got all the mass, and then there's all this empty space around the nucleus, right? So, if you irradiate something, and you 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 um, you direct particles at material, and these particles are on the same order of magnitude in terms of size as atoms and electrons, it looks like empty space to them. So that's why this is the most this is the most common uh, most common interaction right here, soft collisions. Okay, and then Trenkov. Have you folks heard of Trenkov radiation? So Trenkov radiation, this is, I just threw this in because I wanted to define it. Uh, Trenkov radiation exists when the velocity of the incident particle traversing the transparent dielectric material. So transparent material like acrylic or polystyrene or some kind of, some kind of insulating plastic material. If, if electrons traverse it uh, and the velocity of the incident particle um, <coughs> exceeds C over N, where N is the index of refraction, if it exceeds that ratio, then you're going to see this blue light being emitted within that, within that material. And, I've, and we've seen this in, um, in the clinic because we created these, oh, I should have brought one, I have one upstairs. We created these things called electron trees. And um, an electron trees, here, let me do this, let me just try this. So to create electron trees, we have a, a linear accelerator, linear accelerator head, and then on the on the floor, we would put a piece of acrylic, which was I don't know, it was about maybe three or four inches by three or four inches on a cube, and we would direct we would direct electrons at it. We would direct an electron beam at it, but. This electron beam had, didn't have a scattering fall. We removed the scattering fall. Okay, so it was a pure, it was a pencil beam of electrons, no scattering fall, really high dose rate, and we would irradiate this thing, this piece of acrylic, with electrons, and uh, know, electrons are red. Okay, and <laughs> just having fun. And so we irradiate the piece of acrylic, and then we'd come into the room, and of course we'd, we'd uh, turn off the beam. Then we'd come in the room and we would take a nail, we'd put a nail on this, we'd put a nail. You can hit that button. What's that? Right. It says click here to restore drawing. Which one? It just disappears. Yeah. Oh really? Did I just delete the drawing somehow? Anyway, so then we, I'll uh, just redraw the block, it's easy. So we would take a nail and um, and then this nail would be grounded, and we'd tap it. And once we tap this nail, um, what? Once we tap this nail, all the electrons that were stored in the acrylic. Remember, it's a dielectric material. Dielectric material can hold charge. It can hold charge. It can It doesn't conduct charge. If it conducted the charge, we would lose all the electrons. 
But since it's dielectric, all the, all the electrons that are stored in here are just sitting there. It's kind of like a sponge, an electron sponge. But when you tap it, you're sending a shock wave, and all these little electrons all of a sudden get shocked out of their, um, out of their um, trapping centers. Have you guys taken solid state physics? We can talk about trapping. There's a lot of trapping centers in a dielectric material. They come out of their trapping centers and they flow to they flow to ground and as they do that they create these these defect paths in the in the acrylic as they're doing that and it looks like a beautiful tree. I've got one or two in my office and I'll show them to you. And it just looks like if you show this to somebody they're like, well, how did you make this? Is this with a? It looks like one of those laser you know those kind of souvenir things that they laser etch, but it's a lot more. It looks a lot more natural. So those are electron trees and. By the way, as, we, as we're doing this, we would point the camera, we're outside, and we're watching this cube being irradiated, and it emits blue light. So that's what it, so we've seen our turn cut radiation when we did this. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, all right, so moving on to hard knock-on collisions. So we're getting a little closer now. Our particles are getting closer to the atom, where B is very close to A now. Very, the uh, impact parameter is similar to the the radius of the atom incident particle interacts with the orbital electron which is ejected and called a delta ray okay so then this this orbital electron is now ejected and it's called we call that a delta ray okay and this it's called a delta ray because it has enough energy to to, to move a certain distance okay if if this ejected electron just like kind of just dropped out right here. We wouldn't call it a ray because it's not going anywhere. It just deposits its energy locally. Delta rays actually move some distance. So this electron dissipates its energy along another path called a spur. Okay, so this is, this is the spur here. This is just another terminology. That's the spur. So it deposits its energy along a spur. Notice how it's not straight because electrons, they have charge and they have mass, so they interact with everything in the way and they kind of bounce around. Okay? So this process occurs seldom, but is associated with a high transfer of energy. So the transfer of energy being from the incident particle uh, transferring its energy to the electron and ejecting the electron. So that's a hard knock-on collision. Number three, Coulomb force interactions with nucleus, uh, where the impact parameter is a lot smaller than B. I'm sorry, they're a lot smaller than A, the radius. This is when an incident particle interacts either elastically or inelastically. So elastically means that there's no x-ray given off. Momentum is conserved, the electron maintains velocity and is scattered away, and this occurs not too often, about 2% of the time. Okay, so the electron comes in. Um, the the x-ray, by the way, that would be given off would be a Bremsstrahlung x-ray, <coughs> right? So there's no x-ray given off in, if it's elastic, because there's no, there's no transfer of energy. There's no energy. Uh, an, an elastic collision is when there's no transfer of energy. It keeps the same energy. An inelastic collision is when one form of energy transfers into another form of energy. Like it, you drop a billiard ball and it hits a table. That's inelastic because it's converted to sound. Okay? It's, all right, so now there's no transfer of energy. This electron just gets deflected away. Inelastic, x-rays are given off. So we're converting kinetic energy from the electron. So kinetic energy is converted to Bremsstrahlung X-ray energy. That's that's inelastic. We're doing an energy conversion. Okay. So it's given off as Bremsstrahlung. Electron loses velocity and is deflected. Okay. So that's number three possibility. Okay. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna talk about mu, and it's so important that I made it so big. <laughs> okay. Because I want you guys to know how important mu is and to understand the implications of it and what it means and to get a feeling of what that, what that uh, parameter uh, does. So mu is, mu is equal to the, um, the number of interactions divided by the thickness of material. Okay? So it's, a, it's called the linear attenuation coefficient. Okay? And it's defined as, simple definition from you is the fraction of photons that interact in, in a thickness delta x divided by delta x. Okay? So what's going to affect this? What's going to affect, what do you think is going to affect mu? So here's delta x, by the way. Here's a little picture. And here's uh, photons coming in this way and they interact in delta x. What's going to affect mu? What do you think is going to affect mu? Fraction of photons. So as this goes up, Mu is going to go up. 
As this goes down, mu is going to go up. What affects, the, what affects the number of interactions in a material? What do you think? Density of the material. Yep, the density. Why is that? Because there's more, more atoms in a particular volume, right? So if there's more atoms, there's going to be more interactions. Yeah, density. Okay, what else? So Z, the yes. atomic number, right? Because if there's, if there's a higher Z, then there's more electrons, and there's more electrons in the material for interactions. So high, a high Z means a high number of electrons to, to interact. Okay, so those are a couple of things. And then <coughs> energy is another one, okay? So energy is going to... We also, we also mentioned that low energy photons interact more readily than high energy photons. Okay, so here's an example. So if mu is equal to 0.1, and by the way, the units of mu are... Um, centimeters to minus one, so one over centimeter. So you can say it's per centimeter or centimeters to minus one. So if mu is 0.1, that means if we convert that to a sentence, that means that 10% of the photons will interact in each one centimeter layer. All right, so here's some, some photons of a particular energy. Well, if mu is 0.1 for this material, that means that 10% are gonna interact in this material uh, in, in one centimeter of this material. Okay, so if this is one centimeter, how many photons are coming out? 90%. 90%. Okay, so the interaction coefficient has to do with what's happening in that material, what's interacting with that material. So don't, don't get confused. Don't think this is the transmission coefficient, like how much gets transmitted. It's actually how much stays inside, okay? So 90% 90 will not interact, so 90% leave the material, okay? So if, is mu greater for lead or air? So say delta x is the same. Say delta x is a cm. What do you think? Uh, it's greater for lead. Yeah, it's greater for lead. Okay, that's an easy question. It's greater for lead because lead, so the density is higher. Density, we talk yeah. about density. Z is higher. Density. We have a lot of reasons that mu is higher. Okay. So here's an example. 100 photons strike a target with mu equals 0.1, same mu as before, per cm. How many exit the first cm? All right, so I'll look at this. I'll draw a picture right here. Oh, I love this. I love this smart board. All right, so there's, um, here's the material, and then we have exit the The problem with this board is I'm, I'm in the way when I'm drawing it. Uh, so exit the first cm. So here's one cm, and then two cm, then there's this is, a, this is another CM, and here's another CM, okay? So the question is, how many exit the first CM? So how many come out this way? 90. 90. So we have 90 coming out of 100, and we have 90 entering this second CM. Okay, so how many come out this way? Uh, 81. 81, right? 10% less. So we have 81. Okay. And then how many exit this? 7, 10, around 7, 2. 7, 2, 3. Yeah, and then if you plot this, if you plot this graph of thickness versus um, thickness versus intensity, intensity of the beam, you're going to get an exponential decline because it's 10 percent, 10 percent, 10 percent. But it's 10 percent of the previous. It's not 10 percent of the original. If it was 10 percent of the original, it would be a straight line. Okay, but it's 10% of the previous, so you get this exponential decay. Okay, so that's where, that's where the exponential attenuation comes from. All right. So the reduction in the number of photons is proportional to the number of incident photons. Okay, so we know that. We just talked about that. And dn, the small number of photons, is proportional to ndx. Now, this looks like that older formula that we had about the radioactive decay. Remember that the older formula, dn is proportional to mu, yeah. mu dx? Okay. So now this is very similar, and it's derived in the same way. So, so if you want to see how that's derived, you can go back to the slides where, where, I, derived the, um, where I derived this one. Mu, mu t or mu x, okay? So it's the same derivation as that one. Now, what does mu depend on? So mu increases with more interactions, okay? and mu also decreases um, 
I'm sorry, mu increases with a decrease in photon energy. Okay, with a decrease in photon energy. So if photon energy drops, mu goes up. Okay? Why? Well, that makes sense, because lower photon lower photon energy, more interactions. Okay? Also, mu increases with z. So z goes up, more electrons, mu increases. Okay. Now let's go on to half value layer. So half value layer is equal to the thickness we require to reduce initial intensity by 50%. We already talked about that, right? And uh, it's equal to the natural log of 2 divided by mu. So that's the definition of half value layer. And what's the num numerical value of the log of 2? You're going to use this number over and over. Uh, 0.69. Yeah, okay, so just remember that. So line of 2 is 0.693. Okay, and um, so um, some other identities, so some other equations. We looked at the, the first equation was I of x equals I0 e to the minus mu x. That's the first one. And then these are, these are other ones. So uh, if we use half value there, we can say I sub 0 e to the minus line of 2. Uh, times x um, over half value layer. And then this is another one. Okay. And depending on the problem and the question, you might want to use this one, you might want to use this one. I might give you a half value layer. If I give you a half value layer, this, this one might be more practical to solve the question. The question. And we're going to go into how these all get derived in, uh, at the end of the class. So half value layer, what does it depend on? Material, photon energy, and wide versus narrow beam. So it makes sense that it would depend on the material, because thicker material is going to... Uh, is lead going to have a higher or lower half value layer than plastic? Lower. Lower, because it takes less thickness of lead to reduce the beam by 50%. Okay. So as, your, as the density goes up, as Z goes up, you need less amount to reduce the beam by 50%. Okay. Um, so the material, photon energy, again, if the photon energy is higher, it has more penetrating capability. Therefore, if the energy is higher, does the half value layer go up or down? Go, go up. Half value layer has to go up because you need more to, to stop this higher penetrating beam. You need more to stop 50% of the penetrating beam. Now, here's an interesting one. Wide versus narrow. This one's interesting, and this uh, I think Khan covers it. So, wide versus narrow, why is that, why is that different? Let's do this. Oh, shoot. Keep hitting the wrong button. Up. Uh, boy, these slides get messy with all that writing on them. Okay, <laughs> let's do. Let's do. Um, let's do a blank slide. Okay, blank slide. So. So wide versus narrow beam. By the way, the half value layer. When whenever you see published values of a half value layer, they're usually referring to the narrow beam half value layer. So narrow beam, what's narrow beam? Here's a narrow beam. I'm going to show you guys how to measure half value layer, okay? Here's a beam of radiation, it's narrow, and here's an attenuator, and then over here I have a chamber, and it's hooked up to my electrometer. Okay, here's an ionization chamber, it's hooked up to the electrometer. Now I place a certain thickness, T, in the way of the beam, and some of the beam, com some of the beam comes out, and this thing measures um, the transmission through T. Okay, so the way you measure half value layer sim very simply is you use different t's. Okay, so you add t and you get you know the first t you the first t you put in here, you'll you'll get maybe 90% of the beam being transmitted, and you write down you know t equals one for example transmits 90%. All right, then you put another layer on here and you say t equals two, and that transmits 60%. Now you're down to 60%, and then you put another layer on here, and you measure. And so now you've got a thickness of, and these could be millimeters, cm, whatever units you want to call them, t equals 3. Now you're at 40%, okay? So you've now crossed the 50%, 50% uh, where the half value layer is defined. So then the half value layer is going to be somewhere between 2 and 3, okay? And you can plot this and interpolate it and figure out what the half value layer is. That's how you measure half value layer. Okay, now, if we have, so that's narrow beam. Okay. That was that was narrow beam. All right. So now we're gonna we're gonna do broad beam, and broad beam is just like the name implies. It's a, it's a larger field size. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to increase our fuel size now. Okay. What happens when we increase our fuel size and do the same experiment? So if we increase our fuel size for a certain thickness t, uh, what happens here is that this, this chamber is now going to start receiving scattered radiation from here. Okay, so um, as you add material on here, this, this does decrease, but it doesn't decrease as quickly as the narrow beam because it's receiving scattered radiation. Okay, so if it doesn't decrease as quickly, that means that for broad beam, it almost looks like a higher energy beam. Okay, because a higher energy beam, it'll be, it won't decrease as quickly as you, put, as you place the absorbers. So because of the scattered radiation, your narrow beam HVL, so, so here, let me write it here, narrow H, N, N means narrow, narrow HVL is less than broad beam HVL. Okay, so your broad beam HVL is going to look bigger than your narrow beam HVL because of the scatter. Okay? As you add absorbers, it's going to decrease this value, but all the scatter is adding to it and it's uh, reducing the, the rate at which it, it reduces the radiation. Okay. Example, in a diagnostic, did I talk about everything? Let me go back to that slide. Oh yeah, so here, let me, let's just continue here. So, so for narrow, getting back to narrow beam, for narrow monoenergetic beams, what's an example of a monoenergetic beam? Electron beam. Yeah. What's an example of a photon monoenergetic beam? Uh, where, would we, where would we see it? Uh, it's cobalt 60. Cobalt 60 is monoenergetic. Most beams that we deal with are polyenergetic. So for a narrow mo monoenergetic beam, now here there's different half value layers. There's half value layer 1, half value layer 2. Now, uh, the difference between half value layer 1 and 2 is half value layer 1 is the first um, the first half value layer. Okay, so this say this goes from 100% to 50%. Okay, that's that thickness is the first half value layer. When that beam narrow monoenergetic beam. So if this beam were monoenergetic, and I place another the same thickness, so T and T, same thickness here, that 50 is now going to be what? 25. 25. Okay. So half value layer one equals half value layer two. In a poly in a broad beam or a polyenergetic beam, half value layer one is less than half value layer two, which means that 100 comes in, and then 50 comes out. But then you don't get 25 on the second one. You get uh, you get more than 25 on the second one. Okay. And why would you think that? Why would why would that be? If it's polyenergetic, we have a polyenergetic beam. The second half value layer is going to be uh, is going to be uh, greater. Why would that be? Yeah. Because you hardened your beam through the first half value. Layer. Exactly. You've hardened your beam. That's as simple as as that. As that. So now the beam coming out out of this end is a higher energy. Higher energy beams require half, higher half value layer. Okay, good. So beam hardening preferentially attenuates. So oh, the answer is right here, which modifies the beam spectrum as it penetrates. Okay, but you knew that, right? Okay. Uh, what is the attenuation from 10 half value layers? In other words, you know, we said 50%, 10%. What percentage or what ratio would 10 half value layers be? 10%. How would you calculate that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be less than that. Mm -hmm. Well, the first one reduces it by half, then half again, then half again. Exactly, time. right. So 50, yeah. 25, 12, 6, 3, 1, half. Quarter, eight, sixteenth, about a sixteenth. Okay, and rounded. and what you could do is you can use this equation right here to solve that. So x over HBL, if you think about it, this argument is equal to number of HBLs. Okay, so if I have two HBLs, if my thickness is say my thickness x is five, and my HBL is ten. Okay, I have a half. Well, let's do it the other way. Say my thickness is 10, and my half value layer is 5. So x is 10, and half value layer is 5. I have two half value layers. Okay, so this argument here 
could be n, which is number of half failures. Therefore, the ratio of how much comes through is, let's rewrite this equation over here. Let's go to the right hand. We're rewriting the equation. I over I zero. This is the ratio of transmitted, the ratio of, yes, transmitted, not attenuated. The ratio of transmitted radiation is equal to two to the minus N. And if 10 half L is, what's two to the minus 10? One over one 10 over 10. 10. One over two to the ten. Two to ten is ten twenty-four. I believe so. Okay. One over two. Which is around a thousand. A thousand. Okay. Okay. So it's around a thousand. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Okay. So example in a diagnostic X-ray tube, the measured half failure depends on all the following except what. So I showed you guys how we measure half failure error. We use, say we use an x-ray tube in that example. That half failure error would, well that's just came on. That half failure error error would depend on all, except, I guess they just paid their bill. Uh, peak kill voltage, KVP. Average KV, total filtration, radiation intensity, measuring geometry. So which one doesn't affect half failure error? I think it's D. You think it's D? Yeah. What do you guys think? Well, it depends on intensity. That's your I not. Yeah, that's I not. Mm -hmm. So if I did my HVL experiment with I not equals 100, and then I repeated the experiment with I not equals 200, would that make a difference? ratios, yeah. Yeah, so no, it w the intensity doesn't make a difference. So whether I, you know, whether I use the beam at 100 R per minute or whether I use it at 200 and I repeat the experiments, the, um, the ability for that material to attenuate that radiation is going to be the same, whether, you know, whether the rate is 100 yeah. R per minute or 200 R per minute. So, so yeah, so it's this one. Everything else will affect the half failure. Obviously, KV affects the energy of the beam. Average KV is, again, energy. Filtration, we know that that filtration affects the hardening of the beam, okay? And then measuring geometry, that's broad versus narrow, okay? So we know that that. All right, so exa another example. If a material is compressed to half of its original thickness, does this change mu? So we've got a piece of lead, okay? And then we compress this lead. We compress it. It's led down to this thin piece of lead. Okay, same piece of lead. Uh, we just had an elephant sit on it and compressed it. Does that affect mu? All right, so we have mu here and we have mu there. So uh, let's think about this fraction of photons that interact in delta x. Okay, so now the delta x is different. Okay, but the fraction, but so the fraction of photons that interact in this this space here, divided by delta x. Delta x is here. Now delta x just changed, right? That just changed. So the fraction that interact here and here is going to be the same, because we have the same amount of material. But this changes. Delta x changes. This has just reduced. This has gone down. So what happens to mu? It increase. increases. Basically, you know what we did? We just changed the, the density of the material. Okay, so we know that mu does get affected by density. Mu, mu is, is uh, mu does depend on density. Okay, so mu, as you compress something, if you compress something, mu will go up. So I must choose delta x to be small. This equation is just a conceptual equation. I don't want you folks to use this in, in assignments because it only applies for very small, very small thicknesses. Okay, um, because it's, it's really just that dn, dn dx. And whenever we talk about dn dx, we only want to have a, a very small thicknesses. It's just a conceptual equation. 
So I must choose delta x to be small, otherwise if mu is large, example, if mu is 1, it would mean that 100% of photons interact the material, which is not possible. Okay, so um, you can have mu of 1, I mean this is possible, but of course your delta x has to be very, 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 very small. Okay, because if your delta x were 1 cm, you can't, there's nothing that can stop 100% of, of photons. There's always a certain amount that gets through due to the law of exponential attenuation. Okay, now um, multiple materials. What if we have materials that have two different, what if we have a, a substance that has two, that's made up of two different materials? Well, let's see, what, let's see how we, um, what equations govern that. So we have N0, so N0 is number of photons that interact with the first substance, and then NL, and NL is the, um, is the number of photons that exit through this, um, through this thickness L. So the change in x is equal to n0 minus nl. So it's this one minus this one um, times mu x. And now mu x is, um, let's see, mu x, mu x, uh, mu x is one of these two mu's. OK, so delta nx is the change in photons through one of these. And mu x is, x can be one or two. Okay. Divided by the sum of the mu's. Okay, so that's how you that's how you deal with um, with substances that have two materials in them. Okay, now moving towards mass attenuation coefficient. So um, that's just simply right there that equation. It's mu divided by the density of the material. Why do we want to divide it by the density of the material? We want to divide it by the density because when we talk about mu and when we talk about attenuation and absorption in tissue or different materials, we want to take out this this density effect because we want to see how much the material absorbs just because of its nature, because of its composition, and not its not because of its density. So we want to take that out. We want to take the density dependence out, and we do that like we do anything else. We divide by it. Okay. So the mass attenuation coefficient, the MAC, is mu um, mu over mu over rho. So now this is going to be independent of density. It's more fundamental since it depends higher, since it depends on the composition of the material. And the units of this are now, remember the units of mu? So the units of u were C, mu were cm to the minus 1. So if you divide this, what are the units of density? So what is this? What are we left with? Centimeter squared per gram. Right? Yep. All right, so those are the units. Remember that? Those are the units of mass attenuation coefficient. Uh, when using mu over calculations, thickness is expressed in this. So your new thickness, the new thickness is going to be, so whenever you say x, before x was, x was cm, Okay, so now x, when you use mass attenuation coefficient, is going to be um, cm times density, grams per cm cubed, which is equal to grams per centimeter squared. Okay, so thickness will not be expressed in terms of grams per centimeter squared. You'll see this a lot in your books. You'll say there's an absorber of 2.3 grams per centimeter, grams per centimeter squared. And they'll say, wait, that's that's a typo. It's not a typo. It's just expressed. Um, it's a dense. It's called a density thickness. And basically, we're taking the density of the material out. And it's kind of nice because uh, in our field, a lot of times we'll buy. I'll give you an example where we see this. We'll buy a device like the you know the morning checkout device that that we used to check out the linear accelerator, the output of the linear accelerator in the morning. Well, the specs for that they describe how much buildup is over that, how much thickness is over that. They don't need to tell us what material that is. They just need to tell us what the density equivalent is. And so it'll say 1.2 grams per centimeter squared. That's all we need to know. And so what that means to us, since we know water is 1, 1 gram per centimeter cubed, then that's the water equivalent of whatever material that is. So if, if they say, if they spec that material to be 1.2 grams per centimeter squared, that may be made out of acrylic, it may be made out of who knows, aluminum, it doesn't matter. 
But to us, that means that that is 1.2 centimeters of water, equivalent material. Because water, the density of water is 1. Okay? So that's, that's why this comes in handy. Because again, density of water is 1. Whenever you see grams per centimeter squared, that's the water equivalent of whatever material that is. Okay. Uh, what is the mu of lead if its mac is 0 0.001? By the way, mac is not a, it's just a, something I made up here. This is, you won't see this anywhere. I just, I just abbreviated it. Um, if its mac is 0 0.0016, what is the mu of lead? How would I do that? Multiply mac by density. Okay. Yep, that's it. Okay, so and then just make sure you get the units all, all correct because we said 0 0.0016 meter squared per kilogram times density 11 grams per centimeter cubed times, and then you have to do the, the conversions, right? Okay, so we can convert this to, to um, we can convert this to kilograms. Uh, so it's 1,000 grams, 1 kg, 1 kg, uh, uh, is that, is that, uh, 1 kg, times, what about this one? So a centimeter cubed, uh, we want we want a centimeter cubed on top, so how many centimeter cubed to a meter cubed? 100 times 100 times 100, right? So what is that? Is that ten thousand? No, it's a million. <laughs> yeah, it's a million, right? It's a million. So one times ten to the six ten to the six C C's over one meter cubed. Okay, so now the CCs cancel. They cancel here. Uh, meter cubed meter cubes. What's that? You should get an inverse meter, right? Yes, you should get an inverse meter. We have a three here and a two here, okay? And then the CM cubed cancel, this cancels, KGs cancel up to this KG, okay? And so you're, you end up with, um, what number would you end up with? Here, could someone do the math? Oh, I wish I could pay. This thing should have a little calculator, too. Wouldn't that be neat? Maybe it has a calculator. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. What happened here? I made a big mess over here. Get 18. Okay. Oh, 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 one. Six, six times 11.9 divided by 1,000. Times a million? Times one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Is that right? Did I do all that right? Yeah. Okay. I thought it said 11.3. Where? It's 11.9. Oh, is it? Oh, oh 11.3, you're right. It is 11.3. You wrote 11.9. Right. Or Sorry, no, we wrote 11 point gram. <laughs> what happened here? You became a big, I think some stuff got moved around. Yeah. Yeah. Did when you open up the. Calculator. The calculator, calculator. Sentence 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 the drawing. Oh, okay. Okay, well, anyway, it's it's around... Um, 18 or 19? Yeah, something like that. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So, electronic, and, and then... So, all right, so we talk about mu is the total attenuation coefficient. Mu of a row is a mass attenuation coefficient. Some other attenuation coefficients that you'll encounter are um, the atomic, uh, and, uh, the electronic attenuation coefficient and the atomic um, attenuation coefficient. Now, think of think of mu as a probability, because mu is really a probability. It's a probability of interaction. If mu goes high, if mu is high, that means that there's going to be more interactions. If mu is low, mu is low, there's less interaction. So it's probability. Think of it as a probability of interaction per linear centimeter. Okay. So now, if um, per centimeter. So now let's look at these um, mu e's and mu a. So number of electrons per gram. First, we have to define a couple of things. Number of electrons per gram n sub zero is equal to, well, it's equal to Avogadro's number 
Uh, Z is number of electrons per atom. Right? Avogadro's number is number of um, number of atoms per mole. Okay, so so number of atoms per mole times number of electrons per atom divided by number of grams per atom. Oh, no, sorry, grams per mole. Yeah. Grams per mole. You get um, you get the number of electrons per gram. Okay, if you cancel, if you write all those out, you'll get that to cancel. So that's n sub zero, and then a sub zero is atomic weight. So then mu sub e. So this is going to be the probability of interaction based on the sum, uh, sum based on uh, the number of electrons. So it's so mu sub e is equal to mu absorbed over rho divided by n sub zero. Okay, so it's mu mu absorbed over rho, the one, the one we just talked about. Sorry about that. I wish I could erase with my finger. <laughs> I don't have to pick up the dead erase. Oh, here, I can do this. I can, okay. Um, so, mu absorbed over rho divided by the number of electrons per gram is now centimeter squared per electron. Okay. Um, and that's, again, that's a probability. Have you, folks, have you folks have heard of the cross section? in nuclear physics. When you talk about cross-section, it's an area which is really considered as a probability of interaction. If something has a very small cross-section, like in terms of centimeter squared, it won't interact much. Okay? If it has a big cross-section, it means that it'll interact with radiation that's coming towards it. And that's what this is here. So look at this. This is a centimeter. That's an area. Centimeter squared per electron. So it's giving you the probability of interaction per the number of electrons in this material. So that's what mu e is. It's a probability of interaction um, per electron of the material. Okay, and then mu a is simply mu e times z. Okay, so it's the number. So now you're plot, you're multiplying by the number of electrons, uh, which is taking the electrons out of the equation, and now you're just you're just looking at the probability of interaction per atom of the material. Okay. Um, Going back one step, uh, going back to the cross section. Um, do you know what the units of cross section are? You ever learned of, of a barn? You heard of a barn? Okay. You have heard of a barn? So one barn, one barn, let's see if I is equal to one times ten, ten to the minus twenty-eight uh, meter squared. Well, that's a barn. So. The, what's interesting is the r origin of the word barn. You know why it's called barn? It's like hitting a barn, broadside of a barn. Yeah, but why exactly? But why? Where does it come from? Well, at Purdue, they told us they invented that unit. They did. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. No, I believe that that unit came about from uh, when they were when they were investigating. Let's see, when they were investigating the bomb, the race for the bomb, and nuclear energy. Uh, at the University of Chicago and uh, the folks like Fermi and Oppenheimer, they were investigating uranium. Okay? And you, they were, they were um, of course, they were injecting neutrons in your uranium because they were trying to get it to, to create fission. So uranium was such a huge atom at the time. Of course, it's still a huge atom. And it has a huge nucleus. They said that it's like hitting a barn. It's so big that it's like hitting a barn. Okay, And that's where the barn came from. And this, by the way, is pretty close to the cross-section of a uranium nucleus, okay? So that's where, that's the, I think it comes from. So, so again, what's that? You wanna look it up? No, no, I just hit a button that I didn't mean to. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, cross-section. So again, cross-section, think of cross-section as a probability of interaction. All right, now, next, next coefficient that you need to know, transfer of energy. This is really important. All right, so we know that th these interactions occur in the material, but how much energy is being transferred? That's what we want to know. Eventually, we want to know dose, right? And dose is how much energy is transferred to to the patient. We don't really care how many. Well, of course, we care how many interactions, but we're more concerned about how much, how many of those interactions actually contribute to dose and to energy transfer. So this is this is uh, this term here describes again probability of transfer of energy. Okay. Now let's look at this equation now. So mu tran is equal to e. E is the energy of the incoming photon. And so it's e. It's the average. And whenever you see these 
angle brackets, it means it's the average energy. So it's the average energy of the incoming en incoming energy, and we use average because it's polyenergetic. We tend to use polyenergetic energies times mu, and the mu is the one we just learned about, linear attenuation coefficient. Um, I'm sorry, h nu is h nu is the energy of the incident photon. Okay, each trend is that's that's how much energy gets transferred. Okay, so h nu incident. Incident photon energy. Okay. So E tran is the energy transferred to an electron by this photon. H is Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule second. And nu is the frequency of the incident photon. H nu is photon energy. Um, and it considers only kinetic energy transferred to the electrons does not consider energy that's scattered away. All right, so this E tran is just what's transferred to the electrons. And if those electrons then go on to lose their energy through Bremsstrahlung, it doesn't consider that, that energy. It's just the energy um, that's transferred. Actually, it does. In this case, it does, because um, the scattered away, sorry. Uh, in this case, it does, because here comes a, here comes a photon, interacts with an electron. Okay. And this electron will then, uh, some energy is transferred this, to this electron. This electron, that transfer of energy, whatever energy is given to that electron, that's e tran. So if it, doesn't, if it does lose its energy through Bremsstrahlung, that's part of e tran. But this photon can scatter away. Some of this energy can scatter. That energy is not considered an e tran. Okay. This is not considered an e tran. It's just this one. Okay. Um, the mass energy transfer coefficient, that's, a, that's the name of this, this transfer coefficient. So mu absorbed tran over rho. Okay. So that's a probability of transferring energy to the material. All right, then there's another one. So there's transfer and there's absorption. Once it's transferred the energy, how much of that gets absorbed? So that's what this coefficient will give us, is how much energy gets absorbed. And this is simply, it's mu tran times one minus g. Now g is the Bremsstrahlung yield. So different materials will create a different different materials and different materials and different energy will will uh, affect g. G because g is how much uh, it's a, it's a ratio from zero to one of uh, of the amount of Bremsstrahlung that occurs in these interactions. So now some some things that affect g. So G, uh, low Z materials have a low G. Okay, so there's not much Bremsstrahlung going on in low Z materials. It makes sense, right? Because if it's a low Z, it means the nucleus is small, therefore it doesn't have as much charge, therefore it doesn't attract the electron as much. So low Z has lo low Z, low G. Okay, and then, and then if G is really small and there's not much Bremsstrahlung, then mu tran equals mu n. The amount of, so what does that mean? So, so that means that the, ener the photons that are interacting in the material transfer, and, and all the energy that's transferred gets absorbed. Okay. Because the, the only way that it wouldn't get absorbed is if there's Bremsstrahlung. And Bremsstrahlung is energy that gets scattered out of the patient and doesn't get absorbed. Okay. Now, high Z material produces much Bremsstrahlung due to nuclear, uh, nuclear electron interaction, and that's when the impact parameter was close to. Uh, close to the radius of the atom. Um, mu n is very significant in radiation oncology since it describes the energy absorbed by the tissue, which is related to the dose delivered to the patient. Um, energy that's scattered as Bremsstrahlung is not absorbed. Okay. So it's energy that's lost. It's energy that we've created in the LINAC that, um, that um, interacts with the patient that then leaves the patient and it's, and it's lost. Okay. Now where we're mostly made of water. Okay, the water has a pretty low G. So a lot of the energy that we impart on our patients gets absorbed. Okay, now, let's see. Should we see? Oh, let's stop here. This is a good place to stop. Let's just take a quick break. Oh, what's it doing? Uh-oh. It's asking if you want to add to the air drying to the I, I do, but I just want to pause it. I just wanted to do this. Okay, let's keep going. 
All right, so now we're going to move on to, to um, the different types of interactions. Uh, so there's, there's four different types of interactions that you folks need to know about. You're going to hear about this over and over and over again. The first one is not all that important because you know, it doesn't impart any energy into the material. So when photons interact with, with the material through coherence scattering, um, the photon interacts with the atom but doesn't eject an electron. So it doesn't ionize the material. Uh, the atom re-irradiates the photon's energy as a different, at a different angle, and no energy is absorbed or exchanged. Okay, it's also known, this is coherent scattering, is also known as Rayleigh scattering. It's most, most probable at high Z and low photon energy. So low photon energy is like maybe like low KVs with metal. Okay, so low KVs and high Zs. And what the way that works is, here's the atom, the photons come in, they interact, they interact with it, and then they just, they kind of interact with the whole atom, and then they just get re-emitted at a different angle. Well, it's, it is scattering, because they scatter away, but there's, there's no ionization, and there's no energy exchange in this interaction, okay? So that's coherent, coherent scattering. It's not that important to us, because it doesn't impart any dose. It doesn't deposit any dose in the tissue. And the next one is photoelectric effect. This one is important. So the next few are, are important. They're all important, but in terms of dosimetric uh, dosimetric um, significance. Coherent scattering is not that important. So photoelectric effect. Uh, poor Albert Einstein, you know, he discovered a lot, right? I mean, the guy is a genius. It's relativity, general relativity, special relativity. Um, and he was competing against, he didn't get Nobel Prizes for those because he, at the time they gave it to Max Planck for, uh, for his black body radiation stuff. So they gave it to Max Planck. So eventually, they, they did give Albert Einstein a Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect, even though the other the other um, uh, projects he worked on were so much more significant and they had so much more of an impact than photoelectric effect. They did give they did give him this prize in 19. Uh, he discovered in 1905, and they gave him the prize in, in 1921. So what is photoelectric effect? So uh, photoelectric effect. You might have seen this. You might have seen this in. Uh, in college, and have you ever seen those little jars that have an electrode, a little glass jar with a plug in it, an electrode that drops in, and two leaves that kind of, when you when you shine ultraviolet light onto this metal this metal uh, electrode that's inside the jar, there's two thin metal leaves that that push apart, push against each other. Have you ever seen this this device? No. Well, that's an example of photoelectric effect, and what it is basically, it's Photon radiation, so that UV light is, I'll draw, I'll draw this jar. So here's the jar, and there's a, a metal electrode, and there's two thin foils, thin metal foils. And this is metal, this is metal and thin metal foils. And you can irradiate this jar with UV. When you irradiate this electrode, this ultraviolet radiation knocks electrons out of their orbitals. It has enough energy to knock electrons out of their orbitals and therefore creates ions, and, um, and then these, these um, th they, inject, they inject charge into these thin aluminum sheets, and they push against each other because they have the same charge. So that's, that's just an example, a very visual example of how, to photo, how, how the photoelectric effect works. And there's a name for this jar. What's it called? I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, you could probably YouTube it. And uh, so it, for our application, we don't use UV to treat our patients. We use higher energy radiation. Well, you st we still see the same effect. So what happens is an electron is ejected from its orbital due to complete transfer of energy. Okay. So in photoelectric effect, a photon comes in, interacts with an orbital electron, and ejects it out of its orbit. Here's the orbit. Ejects it out of its orbit. And this electron, the energy of this electron, is equal to the energy of the incident photon minus the binding energy. Okay, so obviously we know that electrons have a binding energy. Here's the nucleus. Electrons have a binding energy. So the electron of this, the energy of this electron is incident photon energy minus the binding energy. Now, in this situation, photoelectric effect, there is no scatter. There's no photon scatter, which means that this photon gives up. It disappears. It gives all of its energy up to the electron. Okay, there's no there's no photon that scatters away. Okay. This electron may create photons through Brown's law. Okay. 
but this there's no scatter. So this photon gets completely absorbed by the, by the atom. The interaction coefficient, or so, okay, so you remember mu? That mu is the total interaction coefficient for all interactions. Now, because we're going to talk about different interactions, for electric effect, then we're going to talk about Compton effect, and then pair production, they each have their interaction coefficient. So it's the component, so it's part of the mu. Okay, so this tau is part of the mu. All right, so tau is like the mu for the photoelectric effect. Okay. Again, it's the probability that a photoelectric effect will happen divided by the density of the material. Now, this part here is, that means that the interaction, the probability of interaction, photoelectric inter interaction, is proportional to the atomic number cubed divided by the energy cubed. Heavily, if it's cubed, that means it's heavily, heavily dependent on um, the atomic number, heavily dependent on the energy of the radiation, which means that if the energy changes slightly, it's going to change the probability of photoelectric effect greatly. Right. Okay. So now the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect probably has the highest, um, highest um, dependence on Z and the highest dependence on E, compared to all the other interactions. Okay. So now let's look at a plot. This is a plot. This is these squiggly lines are squiggly because I just drew them with the mouse, not because that this is accurate data. <laughs> So anyway, let's look at this. This is the log of tau over rho in units of centimeter squared per gram. Remember, this is the units of mass attenuation coefficient. So the log of tau over rho, so log of probability of, of uh, photoelectric interaction versus incident photon energy, okay, versus this, this guy, incident photon energy. So, and then, then we can plot this for different materials, all right? So the probability for, for uh, photoelectric interaction at low energies is very high in water. Okay, it's very high in any material, by the way, because if energy is very high, uh, if energy is very low, rather, this probability is very high. Okay, so for very low energies, tau is very high. Okay, so lots of photoelectric effect happening out here at low energies for both water and uh, and lead. And as as energy increases, heavily heavily dependent on energy as it increases. Uh, e to e to the cubed is going to is going to affect um, tau very um, very heavily. Now look at lead. Now lead the interaction. So if you if you pick an energy here, let's see let's see this energy over here. So the, it, the probability of interaction with water is here. Probability of interaction with lead is here. So much greater probability with lead than with water. Okay, why? Because of the z. All right. So now what are these spikes? So these spikes are when that photon energy is, when the photons are energetic enough, at this point here, when they're energetic enough to knock out an L, an L shell electron, all of a sudden the interaction probability shoots way up. Because now the photons have enough energy to knock it out, which means that that interaction is going to be very prominent. Okay, it's going to occur very often. If it occurs very often, it's going to absorb the photons a lot more than than photons that were that had a little bit less energy that weren't able to to knock that electron out. So all of a sudden, it creates this new possibility for the photons. Okay, and because this new possibility is there, they get attenuated much more quickly, and much more often. Okay, and then as the energy increases again, this is going to as it increases, interaction probability is going to uh, drop. And then again, once the photons hit a hit an energy threshold to be able to knock out k edge electrons, again there's a lot more interact a lot more probability of that interaction. Okay? Boy, this is a big mess. Let me erase it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this is a, this is very common again, it's very common for low energy photons, high Zs, makes sense. Okay. So that's the photoelectric effect. The, the one thing to remember is this. So in, in your assignments and the exams, I'll probably be asking you to do calculations. So you just need to remember the energy, the ejected electron is, is the incident minus the binding energy. Okay. Example, a photon detected following a photoelectric interaction is most likely, so after there's a photoelectric interaction, we detect the photon. It's, is it most likely 
incident photon scattered? Is it a newly created gamma ray? Could it be annihilation? Annihilation photon is a photon that's created from uh, positron and electron that interact with each other and annihilate, and then that's an annihilation photon. The, the photons that get emitted after that annihilation. Uh, could it be a characteristic X-ray or could it be Cherenkov radiation? Most likely, what do you think? Could it be this one? No, no. we said there's no scatter. No. Newly created gamma ray. I think no gamma ray. Probably not. Nothing to do, gamma rays have nothing to do with photoelectric, photoelectric vector electron and orbital interactions. Uh, annihilation photon? Hmm? No? Why not? Isn't that only referring to photons created after positron? Yeah, so we didn't talk about positrons, so there's no positrons around. Okay. We're well below the right. 1.02 MeV Correct. threshold for that. You got it. Um, characteristic X-ray? Yes, probably. Probable, okay. Why? Because an ejected electron can knock out an electron from another orbital, and so that, that uh, an orbital above it can fill that hole and create a characteristic X-ray. Okay. Trenkov radiation? Yeah, maybe. Not enough information. Okay, Compton effect. This is the most common effect in radiation therapy. Compton effect was discovered in 1923. And the way it works, a photon, did you folks learn this in, in undergrad? You learned about Compton effect in undergrad? Rings a bell? Okay, so uh, a photon interacts with a free electron, and I'll tell you why it's in quotes, and then it emerges with a reduced energy, so the photon emerges with less energy than, than what it came in with, and it emerges at a different angle, an angle phi, okay, and an orbital electron is then ejected at an angle of theta. Okay, so this basic, the basic schematic looks like this. Photon inter interacts with an orbital electron, which is free, that's the nucleus, Eject, electron is ejected, photon is ejected, and then these are the, the parameters in the equation of theta and phi, and um, h nu is the incident energy, and h nu prime is the uh, energy after the interaction, okay? So those are the, just the parameters of the equation. Now, why is it called free? It's really not free. Electrons are not free. Uh, they're only free in conductive materials, right? And so in wires, it has a voltage across it, then there's free electrons. In, in patients, we're not conducting anything, so the electrons are usually bound within our bodies. But it's considered free because the energy of this radiation is so much higher than the binding energy of the electron. Remember the binding energies that we've talked about. What's the binding K, like the highest binding energy that we've interacted with was 89 keV, right? For, for lead, I think we just saw this. No, oh, here, 89 K. Okay, so that's like one of the highest binding energies that we're gonna see. And that's in metal. That's not even in. It's not even in tissue. In tissue, the, the binding energy is a lot lower. So if we direct energy from our linear accelerator at 10 MeV, that's like that's huge compared to the binding energy. So that's why we consider these electrons free because the binding energy is negligible to this to these photons. Okay. So they're really not free, but they're free for all intents and purposes. Okay, for the purposes of of uh, of this interaction. Okay. All right, so the equations that govern this, you're gonna, go, you're gonna go into this in more depth in your basic radiological physics course. You're actually gonna derive these equations. But for this course, I just want you to, uh, to, know, to know the equations and, and uh, how to use them. So the three basic equations are, number one is the energy of the ejected electron is equal to H nu naught Planck's constant times the frequency of the incident photon. So this could be expressed in MeV. Then alpha, alpha is a, just a, it's a notation, it's just for simplicity to make this so this equation doesn't get too messy. Alpha is equal to H nu naught, incident photon energy, divided by m naught c squared. And what's m naught c squared is the energy of the electron at rest, which is what in MeV? What, what's the rest energy of an electron in MeV? 511 K. Point, yeah, 511 keV or 0.511 MeV. Okay, fine. That's the rest energy. That's m naught c squared. Okay. Uh, so then continue. So that's alpha, and then 
cos of cos of, of phi, and phi is the ejected angle of the photon. And so most of these equations, okay, so then one over alpha times one minus cos of phi. Then this is the this is the energy of ejected photon. They look similar, don't they? Everybody gets these mixed up. Okay, so try to memorize this and don't get them mixed up. The difference, let's see, the difference is that the ejected, the ejected photon energy is a little simpler. Is there's a one on the numerator, okay? So just remember that. So the electron is just a little more complicated because it has an alpha uh, times one minus cos phi. And look at this one minus cos phi alpha, it's everywhere. Okay, so just remember that I think, and just remember where it goes. Okay. And then the last one, the, this, this equation down here, it relates one angle to the other angle. So cotan of, of theta is either the 1 plus um, alpha times 10 of phi over 2. Okay, so if you know the angle of 1, you could calculate the angle of the other, as long as you know your, your incident energy. And uh, that's all you need. It's actually incident energy and one of the angles, and you can calculate the other angle. Okay. Now, some things to remember about these equations and about Compton effect. At phi equals 180, so phi is here, at phi equals 180, that's called a backscattered photon. Okay. At phi equals 180 and backscattering, maximum energy is transferred to the to the electron, which makes sense, right? So if the photon, if the photon comes and hits the electron and backscatters, think of billiard balls. Maximum energy transferred is when a ball hits it straight on, okay, and then and then bounces back. So the maximum energy transferred is when there's a backscattered photon. Um, and then, and then that's the max, the minimum energy of scattered photon if it backscatters. So the backscattered photon uh, is the, m the photon receives the minimum amount of energy after the interaction. As photon energy h nu h nu naught decreases, less energy is given to the scattered electron. And Compton approaches Rowley. So as photon energy h nu de h nu not decreases, as this energy decreases, so as the incident energy of the photon decreases, less and less energy is given to the scattered electron. Okay. Which means that as energy drops, more and more of the um, energy after the interaction. Okay, so here's a photon interacts. Some energy goes to the electron. Some goes to the photon. As the incident photon energy drops, more and more energy will be given to the scattered photon, and less energy will be given to the scattered electron. And that's why we say that Compton approaches Rowley, because it, at, one, at one point, when the energy is low enough, the photon just goes right through. There's no energy exchange. Okay. Um, all right, then, as photon energy increases, so as the incident photon energy increases, Less energy is given to the scattered photon, and most is given to the electron. So as this goes up, more and more energy will be taken up by the electron, and less goes to the scatter of the photon. OK, so here's a graph. This is an important graph. This graph is just basically, we're just taking those equations and plotting them. Okay, those, so we're plotting, let's see, we're plotting maximum and mean fraction of incident photon energy given to the Compton electron. Okay, so this is that capital E equation. So we're plotting this on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we're plotting h nu naught. Okay, and this is E. But it's E, we have two E's. We have E max, and we have E average. Okay, so here's max, and here's average, E, after the interaction. So again, it's photon energy Let's think about the maximum. The maximum energy given to the electron, that's when a photon backscatters, right? So this graph here represents a backscatter photon, the whole graph. Photon backscatters 180 degrees. So if the incident photon energy is 1 MeV, the electron is going to the electron is going to receive 0.8 of that. It's going to receive uh, 0.8 MeV, 800 keV. And then the other 200 kV, the, the photon backscatters with that amount of energy. Okay, 180 degrees back. Okay? Um, and then, you know, so 10, if the incident is 10, now, look at that. Hardly anything goes to, goes to the backscatter photon. Most of it goes to the electron. Okay? Now, mean fraction, 
if we look at all the interactions, or we look at all the angles that the photons are coming through, I'm sorry, not the, uh, we look at all the angles that the photons are exiting at, then the average energy that the electron is going to receive is about a little bit, if it's 1 MeV, if the incident photon is 1 MeV, it receives a little less than, the electron receives a little less than half. If the incident photon is 10 MeV, the, uh, the ejected electron receives uh, 0.65 or so. So again, as the photon energy goes up, the electron receives more and more, more and more of that interaction. Okay. So some notes to, to remember about Compton effect. For high energy photon energy, for high photon energy, excuse me, or large alpha, and remember alpha, alpha is H nu naught over M naught C squared. So for large alpha, high incident, at 90 degree scatter, it can be shown that the maximum scattered photon energy is 511 keV. Okay. That's pretty significant. So for high photon energies, high energy is 6 MeV, 10 MeV, etc., the maximum energy that's going to scatter at 90 degrees is 511 keV. That's really important because if you're shielding a room and you design your room such that the beam comes in a certain direction, you know 90 degrees from there, that's your maximum energy. You're not going to get any energies higher than that. That's important because that tells you how much lead to put in. Okay, at 180 degrees scatter, so this was 90 degrees, 180 degrees scatter, the maximum photon energy is 255 keV. So that's important too. These are important when calculating shielding thickness. Okay, so decreases. So the Compton effect will decrease with an increase in photon energy. Okay, so remember that mu, or sorry, the photoelectric, the tau. Remember how that decreases with photon energy? Same thing happens for Compton effect. And then I'll show you the Compton effect of graph. So as photon energy goes up, there's less and less Compton effect. Compton effect is independent of Z. Look at that. Photoelectric effect had a Z to the three dependence. The Compton effect is independent of Z because Compton effect occurs with free electrons. Okay, so it, ha it, all, it only has to do with how many of these electrons are, are in the material. So, uh, so it depends on electrons per gram, not mass of the nucleus. Okay, so uh, Compton mass attenuation coefficient. So we had tau over rho before, now we have sigma over rho. Depends on number of electrons per gram. Okay, so if you have more electrons in one gram, you're going to have more interactions. Uh, since most materials have nearly the same electrons per gram, the Compton effect is similar for all materials. If you, and actually, if you look at Kahn's, Kahn's got tables in the back, and you look at the number of electrons per gram for materials, it's pretty much the same across the board. Okay? Because the weight of something has to do with, uh, how heavy something is has to do with what's in the nucleus, how many protons are in the nucleus. So, um, so if you're, if you, look, you take a gram of something and you look at how many electrons there are, um, something that's light, like carbon, it doesn't have, it ha it, it has a lot less electrons, but it weighs a lot less than, say, something that's lead. Lead is going to have a lot more electrons, but it weighs more. So the number of electrons per gram is the same. Okay, and except for hydrogen, because if you take a substance and you say, well, what what makes this heavy? It's the number of protons and the number of neutrons. They weigh about the same. Okay, so you have two nucleons per electron. In any substance, you have two nucleons. Technically, on stable substances. You have two nucleons per electron. Okay, so the number of that's why the number of electrons per gram is pretty constant. Except hydrogen, you have one nucleon per electron. So the number of electrons per gram is going to be a lot higher. Okay, because if hydrogen is going to weigh less per electron. Okay, so hydrogen is the only material that's going to have a lot more Compton interaction, twice as many as other materials. Okay, Compton photon attenuation. So all, all the materials with the same density thickness and thickness in the Compton energy range attenuate equally. Okay, so example. Uh, one gram per centimeter, remember this is the, th the density thickness that we talked about? One gram per centimeter squared of air attenuates the same, uh, same number of photons as one gram per centimeter squared of lead. 
for with content. Only only looking at the content effect. Okay, because the number of electrons per gram is the same in this in this amount of thickness. But now let's compare how much thick how thick those materials are in terms of centimeters. Compare so the density of lead is 11.3, density of air is um, 0.001293 grams per centimeter cubed. So the thickness of that air to create this, you know, we're going to take the the density thickness divided by the density, and that gives us the linear thickness. So now we're comparing, yes, the same number of interactions will occur in that much of air versus that much of lead, but look at the difference of linear thickness, 773 versus, what is that, 88 microns of, no, point, point 0.88 millimeters, 880 microns of lead. Okay, so you need this much air to attenuate this mu as much as this much lead. Okay. Lead has a lot more electrons per cc. Now that's cc, not grass. So lead has a lot more electrons per cc. Okay, example. In a Compton interaction, the photon is totally absorbed by a Compton electron. Uh, characteristic X-ray and electron are emitted. A Compton electron can be backscattered. A uh, photon of reduced energy can be backscattered, or all of them. So, A, photon is totally absorbed by the Compton electron. Mm -hmm. No. Based on those graphs, there was always, back, the, even the backscattered photon always had a little bit of energy. Right? So, characteristic X ray and electron are emitted. Well, this is definitely true. Electron is emitted. This could be true. I mean, we don't know. It could be. So it's possible. P for possible. Okay. And then, but what's the best answer, right? I mean, when you when you're doing multiple choice, you always have to choose the best answer. They're all right. But not 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 in this case. They're not all right. But sometimes they're all right. But there's a best answer. So Compton electron can be backscattered. Is that possible? Yeah, it can. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that equation. Can we get a backscattered? Can we get a backscattered electron? So that means that. Hmm, that's a good question. That means that theta can be one eight one eighty. Can theta be one eighty? Let's see. What's cotan? What's cotan of one eighty? We got a calculator. Let's see if this thing goes scientific. No. It doesn't do scientific. Well, it does. It does? End of view. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, 180. Oh, I don't know if it's, it's in degrees. Yeah, it's in one degrees. Okay, 180 cotan. Uh, so that's inverse 10, right? Okay, so cotan. So it's, eight, so it's 90 degrees, approximately. Wait, no, not 9, 89. Cotine of theta is 89. Okay, big back scan. Mm. The tangent of 180 is zero. Yeah, so Cotin. one over a tangent would be a big invalid function. Oh, yeah. So you've got 10. Yeah, but we didn't say, you're looking at this? No, or I said the tangent, and then I did one over the tangent. Oh, okay. Or cotangent. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so that can't happen. So you can't have a backscattered electron. Nope. Okay. There. Okay, and then this one. A photon of reduced energy can be backscattered? That's true. That's absolutely true. So these are possible this is no and this is um this is no yeah. okay so it's so it's it's a uh, d okay next the ratio of compton interactions in one gram of hydrogen to one gram of water is about how many interactions in one gram of hydrogen versus one gram of water let's see yeah, two to one. Okay. A lot more electrons in, 
in a gram of hydrogen than in a gram of water. Okay, number four, the fourth interaction, pair production. Of course, the, the threshold energy for pair production is 1.02 MeV. You cannot create pair production unless your phot incident photons are 1.02 MeV or above. And, you'll, and the, reason, the reason for that is, what is pair production? Pair production occurs when a photon interacts with an orbital, I'm uh, sorry, interacts with, the, with a nucleus, the field of a nucleus. Okay? Interacts with the field of a nucleus and creates mass out of energy. Creates two particles, a positron and an electron. And they are injected in opposite opposite directions approximately. Okay, so you're creating energy out of mass, but and if you add the two masses, it's 511 plus 511 and 1.02. So you can't create mass, 1.02 MeV of mass, without having that much energy. So that's why that's a threshold energy. Photon, intera photon interacts with nuclear electromagnetic field and creates an electron and a positron, receives a total kinetic energy of, so the total kinetic energy of these, of these two particles is going to be equal to the threshold is going to be equal to the incident energy of the photon minus that threshold. Okay, so if that energy is exactly 1.02 MeV, these two electrons, these two particles get formed and they just sit there. They have no velocity. Okay, they're just sitting around. They sit around and they'll annihilate each other. Okay, if they do have, if this is more, then they actually have kinetic energy. The electron and positron do not need to receive equal kinetic energies. They're not shared, always shared equally. Um, the, the production of pair, this is the interaction coefficient for pair production. It's capital, looks like a, is that a pi? Yeah. Capital pi, okay. Capital pi is proportional to z squared. Okay, so it does, it does depend more heavily on z than the Compton effect does. At very high z's, probability is reduced due to screening of orbital electrons to, to incident photons. So as, as z gets really big, I mean, as, as, the, as the atom gets really large, the electron, the orbital electrons will screen uh, the incident photons. And so the photons will interact with the electrons rather than the nuclear field uh, of the atom. Okay, so they, they get screened. So um, as Z gets really high, this dependence drops a little bit. Uh, then there's another effect called tri triplet production. And triplet production occurs in the field of an orbital electron rather than the field of a nucleus. Okay, so it occurs, a photon comes in with a high energy and it creates um, it creates a positron electron and it creates another electron. Okay, and that threshold energy is this. Four times a five eleven. So four times the rest mass of the electron. Okay, pair production is responsible for beam softening. Remember how I asked you guys, how can you soften? We know how we can harden a beam. How can we soften a beam? That's pair production will soften a beam. Alright, how does it soften a beam? gets rid of the high energies? Yeah, it gets rid of the high energies selectively. Mm -hmm. Alright, so, so it predominantly gets rid of the high energies and uh, and the low, what about the low energies? Does it do anything with the low energies? No. Not with pair production. Not with pair. They, the low energies are, they're taken care of by the other interactions. Okay. So, pair production can contribute to beam softening. Alright, so total, what do, we, what do we come up with? Here's our mu absorbed over row that we started talking about. Photoelectric effect, Here's the coherent scattering, um, Compton effect, and pair production. Uh, by knowing the different interaction coefficients, they can tell you the ratios of coherent, photo, Compton, and pair production. Uh, and I believe, I, I mean, I, I ref, reference John's and Hangham, but I'm sure it's, you guys have con with you? Yeah. You do? Okay, because I have one too. I have an older version though with me. Um, all right, so then the total. So here's what the total mass attenuation coefficient looks like. It looks like this. This is what it looks like for water. It drops. So this is the this is the pair production range. Sorry, take it back. This is the photoelectric range down here. Low energies. See how quickly it drops? It drops quickly as energy increases because of the, the E cubed in the denominator. It drops quickly. Um, and then it comes down, and then the Compton range is down. Compton range is here. I wonder if I have other colors here. I could do that. I could do highlighter. Okay, so Compton range is over here, kind of mid range, and then out here. Oh, I guess you call this Compton. 
<laughs> and then out here is hair production. So why do they go up? Because the pair production interaction um, increases with, with energy. Okay, and it increases because now you've hit a threshold and, um, and uh, uh, there's, more, there's, uh, there's more and more interactions as you increase with energy with pair production. Okay, and here's the difference in Z. Here's a high Z and here's a low Z. Remember how it, it was proportional, pair production was proportional to Z squared. Okay, so as Z increases, you have more interactions in the higher energy ranges. Okay. Now, this graph is really important. And I suggest you, you memorize it and just, just think about, let me explain it first. The abscissa is the photon energy, so this is the incident photon energy down on the x-axis. It's a log graph. Okay, and the y-axis is the atomic number of the absorber, so this is Z. Here is Z. And then in here, it's kind of the demarcation. These lines that show you the demarcation between the different effects. So photoelectric effect is dominant out here in this, this area. Compton effect is dominant in the middle and pair production here. But it also, it dep they depend on different things. So you can look at, you can pick an atomic number like 20 and go across and say, okay, for 20, for a material that has a Z of 20 and an energy of 100 keV, and 100 keV, well, that's that point right there is a demarcation line between the, t the two, the photoelectric effect and the and the um, Compton effect. But as the photon energy s goes above 100 keV for a 20, a Z of 20, once it's above 120, 100 keV, then you start getting more Compton effect. If it's less than 100 keV for this Z, you have more photoelectric effect. Okay, it's the transition area where there's more. But then if you take some something with a Z of 80, that's completely different. 100 keV of 100 keV photon is definitely in the pair production range, right? Something with a Z of 80, we're talking about metals, probably something in the metallic, right? So if something's got such a high Z, remember how photo, photoelectric effect was highly dependent on Z? So if Z goes up, it's going to increase photoelectric effect, okay? And so for high Zs, there's not much Compton up here for high Zs. It kind of transitions from photoelectric effect. There's a small, small area where this Compton goes straight into pair production because pair production is z squared, z squared. Okay. There's a lot of Compton down here. Look at all this. This is all Compton. What's the z of water? We're mostly water. So what's our, what's? Do you know what it is? It's around seven. All right. So it's around seven. So here's ten. Here's seven. All right. So seven. Look at seven. Well, it's almost like no matter what energy we shoot at, at tissue, it's going to be Compton. Okay, that's why I say Compton is the most significant energy for us. Um, so hold on, let me just videotape. This is a cool slide. Goes to sleep, I don't know how to turn it on. Okay, so, so again, uh, a, a Z of tissue, the Compton effect is going to be uh, the most predominant across most energies. And what energy do we treat our patients at? Well, somewhere around, here's 2 MeV, 3, 4, 5, 6. So here's 6 MeV, and then here's 10 MeV. But we said the, the average energy that, our, that comes out of these machines is about a third of that. So the average energy is more like 3. Two, three. So, this is the average energy we treat our patients at, right around three, three, uh, three or four, so somewhere around here. So that's all Compton, basically, okay? Of course, that beam interacts with metal on the couch. When it interacts with metal on the couch, then Z, well, even if the Z is high, look at that, it's, it's mostly Compton for high Zs at that energy range. Of course, the, the photons the photons that come out of the beam are polyenergetic, so they do cover a wide range. But most of them are in this range right here. Okay. Now, this, remember this, this is relative interactions in water. Now, this is just water. Okay. This is just water. Water, why? Because we're mostly water. So relative interactions with water. Just remember these. Photoelectric effect versus Compton effect. In other words, the... Um, the... Uh, 
50-50 transition point. I just lost the here. The 50-50 transition point is at 26 keV. Okay, that's extremely low, isn't it? 26 keV. That's where that's where Compton becomes more predominant than photoelectric at 26 for water. Okay, and then at 150 keV, it's mostly Compton. And Compton versus pair production, the 50-50 point for that is at 24 MeV. Are we going to see 24 MeV in our Linux? No, there's no way we're going to see 24 MeV on our Linux. Okay, so so again, it's going to be the 50. It's going to be very difficult to reach this 50-50 point in water. Very difficult, meaning that the energy is going to have to be very high. Okay, so let's stop there. Let's let's do some problems with a half hour. Let's do some problems here. I want to. So now I say yes. Answer the image. Okay, now. Okay, and I don't want to stop the recording yet because I want to record the the problems. Um, here, assignment five. Let's do this. Okay, so this is, I usually assign this assignment. I'm not going to assign it because if I assign it to you guys now, you won't, you won't be able to go through the, the uh, answer. So let's just go through this. I think it's still recording, right? Recording. Yeah, 146. All right, great. Do you need a break? You okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. I think I'm okay too. All right. So the first question, show that half IL air, remember this slide, is equal to ln of 2 over mu. Okay, so um, so what we're going to do, is this big enough? Should I zoom up on it a little bit? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so can I still use this? So we're going to use this equation first, the basic equation. Um, okay, we're going to use that basic equation. It's hard to see. I of x is equal to I naught e to the minus mu x, okay? And then we're going to rearrange the equation. Uh, we're going to say for x is equal to half value layer. Right. So we're going to assign x to be the half value layer of that material. Then if x is the half value layer, by definition of what i is and what i zero is, then i of half by l air should be i naught over two, right? Because that's the definition of half by l air. It's going to reduce the initial by two. Okay, so we have x is HBL and i equals i naught over two. Let's put those into this. Let's put those into this equation. I wonder if I can scroll the screen up. Put it back into the equation, and then we get. Um, so I becomes I naught over 2, and then X becomes HBL. Okay? Then we're going to rearrange this a little bit. First of all, we can cancel the I naughts, and then we're left with 2 to the minus 1, or 0.5, is equal to E to the minus uh, mu times HBL. Then the next step is to take the natural log of both sides. Okay, you can, we're just going to operate both, both sides of the equation equally. So ln of, uh, I skipped a step here, this should be actually ln of e and 2 to the minus 1. But you could take this minus 1 here and just pop it in the front of this equation, right? So that's what I did. Okay, and that's equal to, so uh, uh, an identity of logarithms and, so log, ln of e is equal, sorry, ln of e to the x is equal to uh, x. Okay, so that's just an, a logarithmic identity. So ln, ln of e to the x is equal to x. Okay, logarithmic identity. And that's what I did here. So then this, the parameter, the argument of the exponent drops down to here. And then um, this leads to happy layer equals ln of 2 over mu. Okay, and the negatives cancel. And just the mu is brought down under here. All right, so that's how, that, that's how you derive that. Show how the Compton scattering equation reduces to this. So remember how I said that the maximum energy for a backscattered photon is uh, 255 kV. How do we get that? Well, let's see. Okay. First, we start with our equation that describes the energy of the uh, energy of the.
scattered photon. Okay. And then, of course, cos, cos of 180 is minus 1. So the equation reduces to this. H, uh, H prime is equal to H nu naught over 1 plus alpha. Look at how much simpler this becomes. Well, this minus 1 comes here, so it becomes this becomes 2. Okay, so that's where the 2 comes from. If alpha is very large now, we're going to make an approximation, a mathematical approximation. If alpha is very large, and we said this, we said alpha is a lot greater than 1. Now, that's, that's pretty common in radiation therapy that alpha mu is much greater than 1 because alpha, again, where's the equation for alpha? Do I have it on here? Alpha is equal to h nu naught over not c squared. Okay, so, uh, so if this is 10 MeV, this is 511 kV. So 10 MeV, you can say alpha is pretty high. Okay. So if it's very large, then 2 alpha plus 1 can be simplified to 2 alpha. Okay, because 1 is really nothing if alpha is really large. Okay, so this 1 drops out. And then it be, so then the equation becomes h nu prime equals um, 1 over 2 alpha. And 1 over 2 alpha is m naught c squared over 2 h nu naught. So we're going to put this back into, uh, into our equation. And we get h nu naught that comes from here times this. It simplifies because these um, few things cancel here. The h nu naughts cancel. And you're left with m naught c squared over 2, which is 255 kV. Okay? So that's how you get that. So sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a little approximation trick in here. All right. Next. Number three. A 150 kV photon from a nuclear cell. Okay, so I'll get a little creative here. 150 kV photon from a nuclear cell interacts with a piece of lead at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, a photoelectron that is ejected from the K shell in this lid creates a K alpha 1 characteristic X ray. Okay, K alpha 1 is the L3 to K transition. Okay, and, and then that characteristic X ray goes on to interact with the water in the ocean. Okay. What is the energy of the photoelectron? So, where's the photo? There's a couple of things happening here, right? Here. What's the energy of this, of this guy? The photoelectron that is ejected from the K shell in the light. What's the energy of that? So, 150 kV incident photon, photoelectron. What? Remember what was the what was the equation for the photoelectron? Incident uh, photon energy minus the binding. Right. So 150 minus 89. What was it? Yes. Is it 89? Uh, 88. 88. Yeah. Okay. 88. 88. Well, I thought we had 89 in another slide. Yeah. <laughs> Is it 89 or 88? I think it's 88. Okay, we have 150 minus 88. Okay, so that's, uh, that's 62. Okay, so 62 keV. That's the energy of the photoelectron. Oops. Okay, what is the energy of the characteristic photon? So that what was that transition? L3 to K. So what's the energy of the characteristic? So all the answers are here. So the, the way you do that is you, it's, a, it's the uh, difference of the binding energies, right? So we have a binding energy of 88, which is the K, and we have a binding energy of the L3. So the binding energy of the L3 is 13. Okay. So the energy of the characteristic photon is 75 keV. All right, now we'll, what happens to the, okay, will there be more Compton or photoelectric effect interactions in water with this x-ray? Remember the transition, what was the transition point? Between photoelectric and Compton. Left to right, to right. what was that transition number? What was it? Wasn't it 23 keV? Close. 26. 26. Yeah, yeah. 26. So, will there be more f Compton or photoelectric? Compton. More Compton, because we've passed 26. Okay, cool. From the lecture, we saw that 50 bits more than 26 kV. Okay, so number four. 
10 to the 20, 6 MeV photons interact in 12 millimeters of lead. That's the density of lead. How many interactions are Compton, photoelectric pair, and coherent? Okay, so now we want to know what the proportion of each one is. Okay, now I don't have it worked out, so we'll have to kind of go through this. The first thing you want to do is, uh, is calculate how many total interactions there are. Okay? In this lead. So we have 12 millimeters of lead. How many how many interactions are there? Well, um, I can't do add new slide, so maybe I'll just try it. Okay. I'll just write it over here. So we're going to use I equals I0 uh, E to the minus mu T or X, yeah. T things. Okay. So um, we have 10 to the 20 is I0. E to the minus I think what the density is up there. But we need to look up mu. Can somebody tell me what mu for light is? Well, actually, we'll, the, these books have mu absorbed over rho. So let's look that up. You guys know where to look that up? Okay, so why don't you, why don't you look that up? So what's mu absorbed over rho? or lead, and we're talking about a particular energy, 6 MeV. So what's mu absorbed over rho? So I'm going to say mu, whoops, I'm going to say mu equals, mu equals mu absorbed, sorry, I keep saying absorbed, mu over rho times rho, which is equal to what? Well, and this is 11.3 g per cc. Do you have enough light? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out which table it is. Are we talking about water? Or lead? Lead. lead. Okay, so go to lead. Go to the uh, Josh, go to the section with all the materials. Lots of tables with different materials. Uh, okay, it might so be table A7. There's yeah. a few table A7s. Uh -huh. So go to 6 MeV and watch the units here. It's, these are EVs. So we're looking at 6 MeV, so 6 to the 6. So 6, 6. Yeah. And uh, you've got energies here too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So six six. Four point three nine one to the ne uh, times ten to the negative third. Uh, so that's mu overall. Yes, mu absorbed overall. Sorry, say that again. Uh, four point three nine one times ten to the negative third. One second, I'm going to have to ask you that again. 4.391 times 10 to the minus 3. Yeah. And then the units? Uh, that should be at the top of the column. It's rows in kilogram per meter. Kilogram? Per meter cubed, but it doesn't say what mu's in. So I'm assuming mu is inverse meters. That's it. It only gives it the units for rho. It doesn't give units for mu over rho. The first table. Oh, here. Um, and here we go. Meter squared per kilogram. Okay. So that's meter squared per kilogram. Meter squared per kg, okay. 
So that's mu over rho, okay, times, um, we're going to multiply by rho, and rho we've got in grams per cc, but if you, if you convert grams, to grams per cc to kilogram per meter cubed, you get um, 11,300. Okay. If you do the conversion, so it's 11,300. Can somebody get, tell me what that is? G equals. And we're going to have one over a meter, and then we'll convert to one over a centimeter. Forty-nine point six. Okay. Forty-nine point six. Forty-nine. Oh, because I lifted, I lifted the eraser. I thought they thought I was going to start erasing. Forty-nine point six meter minus one, right? Which is equal to what is that in centimeter minus one? If you were converting meters to centimeters, you'd have 100 times more, but it's the opposite. It's 100 times less. Okay, so it's 0 0.496, I think. Okay, CM minus 1, I think that's right. Okay, that looks right. So we're going to take this, and we're going to put it in our, our equation. I equals I naught, or I already had something in there. I had a 10, 10 to the 6. Sorry, 10 to the 20. I'm thinking it's 6 MeV. This eraser is not cooperating now. Okay. 10 to the 20. Get this arrow out of here. Uh, times e to the minus point. You guys want to start doing the math here? 0.496 times. Um, 0 0.12. 9.4 times 10 to the 19. 9.4 times the 10 to 90. Positive 19, right? Yeah. Uh, 19. Okay. 9.4 times the 10 to 19. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's how many how many exit. That's how many come out of the material. Then how many interactions? It's going to be 10 to the 20 minus this. Right? That's how many interactions there are. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. Okay, so that's so it's point nine four times ten to the twenty. So one minus point nine four. So uh, interactions equals ten to the twenty minus um, point nine four times ten to the twenty, which is equal to point oh six times ten to the twenty. Right. Okay, so that's the no total number of interactions. Okay, total number of interactions. Now we need to we need to calculate how many of each. Now there's another table in Johns and Cunningham. This is where we go into cross sections. Remember the cross sections, guys. The cross sections is the probability for something to happen for one of those effects to happen. So there's a table in here. There's a table in here that that indicates the probability of each interaction. And uh, I'm used to Johns and Cunningham, so I'm flipping through this a little bit. Um, okay, where are you? Maybe, it, maybe this doesn't have it. Mm, racism.
Where are you? 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 Mm, hmm. Maybe it's in the chat. Maybe it's in here. Chapter 5, right? Oh, yeah, here it is. Well, it's not a very detailed table. Uh, but it's table, f oh, in this, in this con, in the old con, it's table 5.2. And it's right after the, um, right after this graph right here. This, this graph here. So it's right after that graph. This is the graph, right? Uh-huh. I don't have a table. Yeah. Do you not have five table five point two? Yeah. Well, there's table five one, maybe it's further in. Oh yeah, further. Keep going. There it is. Yeah. yeah, that one. So what you do now is with this with this number of interactions, you multiply this by um let me do a whiteboard here. Hmm. Okay. The next step you do is you multiply the, I need a, like a white space. Huh. It's not listening anymore. When I hit what? Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Oh, it was just stuck. Okay. Uh, did it lose all the notes? Yeah. A button came up for like a split second. Mm. I, might, I might have pushed delete. <laughs> a mistake. But anyway, what you do next is you take the number of interactions, you multiply. Where is the question? Question four. Question four. Thanks. So you take the number of interactions times um, tau, for example, divided by the total number of interactions. So you take a tau sigma plus tau plus, this isn't very clear. I'm going to find a way of getting a, a whiteboard on for Microsoft Word. So you'd have number of interactions. times, if you want to know photoelectric effect, you do tau over tau plus sigma plus coherent plus um, pair production. So you take all of those interactions uh, from, the, from the table, the relative interactions take tau. So it's basically a ratio, OK? So total number of interactions times the ratio for that particular interaction. And then you should get these numbers, OK? Let's keep going. No, I don't I think I have to teach a closet. Noon. Oh, hi, it's me. Hey, do I have to teach at noon? On my schedule, it says I have test groups at noon, but. Or is that the, at the regular time? Well, you know how the schedules are a little bit screwy on my iPhone. Okay, so I'm free for right now. Okay. Okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, bye. Okay. Got a little time. Uh, okay, next, five. Mass attenuation coefficient of 300 keV photons in lead is this number, and you guys have the same, you guys have a table in, in uh, Khan where you can look this up. Uh, calculate the linear attenuation coefficient, the electronic coefficient, and the atomic coefficient. So linear attenuation coefficient, very simple, just multiply by the density, right? So do that, you get 4.5. Oh, didn't we say it was 0.45 in our problem? So we were off by a decimal point in the last problem, okay? So there's something something screwy with there. Um, maybe the conver conversion did we miss it. CC cubed to meters cubed, that was, that's a million. Right? 100 times 100 times 100. Huh? That's a million. That's a million, yeah. 
So that one was right. I don't know, anyway. This is the right number. So then in part B, part B asks for uh, the electronic coefficient. Remember that equation? So the number of electrons per gram is Avogadro's number times the atomic number times, uh, sorry, divided by the atomic weight. And you get this value here. Here's Avogadro's number. There's the atomic number for lead. And then here's the atomic weight of lead, grams per mole. Multiply all those out, and you get a number of electrons per kilogram here. So then the electronic attenuation coefficient is mu absorbed over rho divided by n sub zero from that from the slide that we saw previously. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. we're gonna need to be setting up in the oh, you room are? in the yeah, we have it at noon, so Oh okay. We're gonna finish up. That's why we'll we'll make this the last room we set up, okay? Okay. Thanks. Uh and we'll get clean up. Let's just finish this problem. And then the, the last one, the atomic one, is simply remember we just multiplied by z for the atomic, the mu sub a. Remember that mu sub a? The atomic coefficient. Um, let's see. Give me the same number of photons in there. Cool. I'll let you guys work on these. All the answers are here. Okay. So there'll be similar questions to these in the in the midterm. And there's some questions about e tran. Um, okay. You know what else? We could run upstairs and just do these. Remember that. Let's run upstairs and accomplish what we're going to do.